In this recording, we'll be discussing the so-called gluconeogenetic process, or I would uh, prefer abbreviating it as GNG. And the way that I would discuss it is something that is closer to us, uh, something that I have discussed already. So I will not yet uh, define it the way that many books define it. I will do it later, but for now, I want you to look at this one. And obviously, as you can see here, you, you may be like, hey, what's this doing here? We're already done discussing it. This is glycolysis, right? And of course, I am trying to remind you of what glycolysis looks like. This, are li li this what you can see here, are literally 10 steps. And we've discussed this already in a previous regarding. So, my point here is, first, just to make things simple to digest, think of gluconeogenesis first as a reverse of glycolysis. So, it's as if, if in glycolysis, I start with glucose and I end up with pyruvate. Here, I'm not going to anymore be accurate with the counts, right? So, although we do know that it's two molecules of pyruvate, glucose to pyruvate is what you can call glycolysis. And the simplest way to think about G and G is just going from pyruvate back to glucose. Now, let me ask this question. Is it really possible that one pathway will be the exact opposite of another? And the answer should be a resounding no. Why no? Remember, a pathway should always have some sense of direction. And thus, we know that glycolysis, in order to direct us to the direction of or to the goal of making pyruvate, should have irreversible steps. Thus, we again remember that for glycolysis, we have step 1, 3, and 10 as the irreversible steps. However, one question that I would like to give you is, are these reactions really irreversible just because by nature the substrate uh, sorry the product can never go back to the substrate or is it just because of the enzyme and the answer is the latter that is it is actually possible for fructose 1,6-bisphosphate to go back to fructose 6-phosphate it's just that when we were discussing glycolysis the enzyme PFK can only convert fructose 6-phosphate to bisphosphate, but not the opposite one. So it's just the fault of the enzyme, but not impossible. Thus, if we want to convert the product back to the substrate, we just need a new enzyme. That's all. So for example, pyruvate kinase can only convert PEP or PEP to pyruvate, but it has no capacity to convert pyruvate to PEP. This, however, is possible, but you do need a different enzyme. The same logic goes with step 1. So if we want to convert glucose 6-phosphate or G6P back to glucose, we do need another enzyme. But the good thing about this is that for the other steps, the reversible steps, the same exact enzyme could be used in gluconeogenesis. Because, for example, in this case, phosphoglucoisomerase can convert G6P to F6P. But, of course, this arrow clearly states that you could use the same exact enzyme to go in the direction of gluconeogenesis or the opposite uh, direction. So, that means for uh, step 2, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9, since you use the exact same enzymes, you just need to remember these from glycolysis. So now, our problem is dealing with the new enzymes for reversing steps 10, 3, and 1. So let's do that. I do need a separate slide for this, like so. And uh, do notice I'm already uh, going the reverse uh, direction. So here, I start with pyruvate, and now my bottom most molecule is glucose, which is uh, supposedly the direction in GNG. So, I did mention that peptopyruvate is facilitated by pyruvate kinase, and pyruvate kinase cannot do the other way around. So, what's the question mark a while ago? What are the enzymes, here enzymes because there are two of them, what are the enzymes that can reverse the step? The first one is pyruvate carboxylase, which from the name carboxylase will add a CO2 molecule. 
such that the 3 carbon compound pyruvate will be converted to the 4 com carbon compound oxaloacetate. And then, uh, in order to fully go back to PEP, we need the enzyme PEP carboxykinase, which will actually uh, remove that extra carbon we added a while ago in the exchange of adding a phosphate. So from four carbons, we now go back to three. Just Well, we do know that PEP should have three carbons. And oxaloacetate does not have a phosphate. Phosphoenol pyruvate has. So that's uh, hopefully uh, going to give justice to the name PEP carboxykinase. Yeah, and after step 10, this is step 10, right? The remaining steps, these, these are actually steps uh, 9 to 4, are reversible. So again, I did mention that um, you just need to remember the enzymes in glycolysis for this. Now, once we reach fructose bisphosphate, if you want to make it fructose 6-phosphate, this is step 3. And we know that the reverse process is facilitated by PFK. The enzyme... So this is a new uh, enzyme. The enzyme that could uh, do the reverse of what PFK does is called FBPase, or fructose bisphosphatase. This is very convenient because as long as you remember what this means, which is fructose 1,6 bisphosphate, the enzyme is basically just you know, adding the suffix ace and you're done. So the name of the enzyme is fructose 1,6 bisphosphatase. After that, you get the F6P, and F6P to G6P is a, re uh, a reversible step. So, uh, the same enzyme you memorize for step in glycolysis is going to be used here. And then finally, uh, this is step one. So, we know that glucose to uh, G6P is facilitated by hexokinase, and hexokinase cannot do the other way around. So, the new enzyme that can do the opposite uh, direction is called g 6 space or glucose 6-phosphatase which is, again, easy because as long as you remember glucose 6-phosphate, just add ACE, then you have the name glucose 6-phosphatase. Now, in that case, you would actually notice that the name of these enzymes end in phosphatase. So when you do encounter an enzyme that ends in phosphatase, they are enzymes that remove a phosphate. No wonder. Uh, remember, in fructose bisphosphate, you have two phosphate molecules, right? And then after this phosphatase acts on the molecule, you now just have fructose 6-phosphate. Only one remains. Or when you had G6P, there's one phosphate. After g 6 base or glucose 6-phosphatase acts, you now have glucose without any phosphate. So hopefully that also puts the logic uh, to their name. So... We just need to remember four new enzymes to reverse pyruvate back to glucose. This, 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 and this. Now, before I want, uh, proceed to other things I want to mention, do note that this is a very special enzyme because glucose 6-phosphatase in humans is expressed only, well, not only, but primarily in our liver around well, references say around 90%, wherein most other organs and cells in our body do not have this. Thus, if other organs do not have this enzyme, those organs don't have the complete set of enzymes for a GNG, so they do not perform GNG. So what I'm trying to say here is that in our entire body, the one which performs majority of gluconeogenesis is the liver. Actually, uh, a little bit is done by the kidney, but uh, by including the kidney, this is almost like 100% already. So no other organ except the kidney, and especially the liver, can perform what you are seeing right here. Now, I did mention a while ago that I have not yet written or mentioned the actual process or definition of GNG. So how do textbooks often define it? They define gluconeogenesis as the conversion of non-carbohydrates to glucose. So in a sense, it's like your starting point is something that is not a sugar, and then the end point is a sugar. So if you go from not a sugar to a sugar, basically you can think of this glucose as brand new, right? Because it wasn't a sugar before, now it is. That's why in the first place we call it gluconeo because it's as if 
your sugar is brand new. And thus, we have to respect the fact that when you say non-carbohydrate, it's a very broad term. Pyruvate is one of them, but it is not the only example. So, for example, a while ago, I told you, imagine gluconeogenesis is pyruvate back to glucose. It's just one possibility. But there are other possibilities because there are other non-carbohydrates. So what are those? As you can see, the other non-carbohydrates include amino acids, glycerol, and even lactate. So first, let me tackle amino acids. Of course, we know that amino acids are the building blocks of proteins. And in the case that we are already starving, okay, or in extended fasting states, our body is expected, and I've discussed this also in glycolysis, we expect that our body would deplete its blood sugar supply. So there's a decrease in blood sugar levels, and our body senses that, and again, in order to maintain homeostasis or balance of our blood sugar, our body should find ways of, so our body response is to increase blood sugar. Well, if you think about it, from the name gluconeogenesis, you are literally making glucose. So technically speaking, gluconeogenesis is going to increase blood sugar. So it makes sense that your body will only perform GNG only when you are already starving. Of course, again, primarily by your liver. And this, of course, is stimulated by our glucagon hormone, which has the purpose of increasing our blood sugar. Now, this is the reason why, for example, some people who are already starving for days start to become, quote-unquote, skin and bones, right? They already lose their muscle mass because what happens is that their body tries to use their proteins from their muscles as energy source. And uh, one of the uh, pathways to do that is, first, their body breaks down their muscles. They become amino acids. They can actually enter the Krebs cycle. Now, what you should know is that uh, at this point, we may we have not yet discussed this unless you've skipped to my discussion of Krebs cycle. But nevertheless, the point is, one of the molecules in the Krebs cycle is oxaloacetate, which coincidentally is part of the reversal of step 10 a while ago. What I'm trying to say here is that if your body has no other option for finding blood sugar or replenishing your blood sugar levels, it will use the amino acids. So normally, amino acids, once they enter the Krebs cycle, they could go to many other possible pathways, or they could just resume and go back to the cycle and just not go out. But if your body decides to create more glucose, the moment that your amino acids become oxaloacetate within the cycle, oxaloacetate will be forced to become PEP, and thus go all the way down to glucose. And that is how amino acids can become glucose. That's why even in the first place, if you've already discussed the many classifications of amino acids, remember we have what we call glucogenic amino acids. We already know, well, it depends on what you've studied before, but there are amino acids that can be converted to sugar. And what you are literally looking at right now is how that happens. Okay, now another uh, thing that we could use to become glucose is glycerol wherein most of the glycerol that we liberate from our body comes from our fats or triglycerides. So, it also happens that when we are starving, okay, or in the fasted state, that's also the time our body starts to decide breaking down its fats. That's why some people fast for extended periods, right? So, because they know they start to burn their fats uh, passively. And uh, a series of lipases, there are several of those, will try to, as the name implies, break down these tags such that we get the constituents, namely fatty acids and glycerol. Fatty acids will uh, go through another pathway that I will discuss in the future, but uh, that would uh, not be discussed for now, so let's set that aside. Although most of the energy we get from triglycerides actually comes here. However, we should not ignore this little glycerol molecule because this could also be significant. Particularly, uh, this glycerol could be phosphorylated to become glycerol phosphate by a certain kinase. And then glycerol phosphate actually only has to be oxidized by uh, glycerol phosphate uh, 
dehydrogenase to become DHAP. And once it becomes DHAP, it essentially enters the gluconeogenetic pathway, going all the way down to glucose. It's as if there's a portion of our fats, particularly the glycerol, that could also be a contributor to the glucose that we produce when we are already starving. So that's three for the moment. One, we have pyruvate, two amino acids, three glycerol. These are actually the three molecules that we could use when you are starving to make glucose, to make energy. However, another <coughs> extra non-carbohydrate is lactate. Remember, our body will only produce lactate, or our cells will only produce lactate if you force the anaerobic state. So imagine that this region right here is a part of a muscle cell that has been uh, expended most of its oxygen. So, of course, normally pyruvate is converted to acetyl-CoA. That is the aerobic state. But since I have explicitly stated that we are now uh, thinking of this as the anaerobic condition, this is not anymore possible. So our pyruvate has to become lactate. Now you may also say, um, our glucose has been converted to pyruvate. This is glycolysis, right? Um, wouldn't it be just possible for pyruvate to go back to glucose so we avoid making lactate and not have cramps? Well, if we can, then we, we, we would have done it. But this is not possible because if you want to convert pyruvate to glucose, what's that? That's literally what we are seeing here, right? This is GNG. And my question now is, is GNG possible in the muscle? I have just stated a while ago that the only organs that can perform GNG are the liver and to a little extent the kidney. So the muscle cannot do this. So you have two choices now. The pyruvate will stay as pyruvate or it has to become lactate. Now, of course, it is inevitable that we will produce lactate. And I did mention that this produces or contributes to the muscle cramps. Now, if you had the cramps yourself, you may remember that you really didn't need to take any medication for the cramps to go away, right? Normally, what a person with cramps would have done is stop moving because it hurts, of course, and just rest. Why? Because the body has a way to deal with it. But you may say, uh, lactate can be converted to glucose by the muscle because uh, of this. You just said that. So how do we deal with this? The answer is rather simple. Of course, we know that the muscle and the liver must be connected in some way via our cardiovascular system, right? So we could just imagine that our muscle has the capability to send this lactate to our bloodstream. And then from the bloodstream, the lactate could be sent to the liver. Once the lactate is sent to the liver, lactate dehydrogenase could shift lactate to the direction of pyruvate and successfully convert pyruvate to glucose. Why? Because we know the liver has the capability to perform GNG. Once that happens, the glucose can actually be sent back to the muscle if the muscle so requires that glucose. And then, uh, we can now use it again to produce energy via glycolysis. And hopefully by this time, uh, when you have rested from your crafts, you must have inhaled enough oxygen so that hopefully you are now available for producing this instead of producing lactate. So hopefully the moment you rest, you now go to the aerobic state and you stop producing lactate. Problem solved. Thus, you could actually see here that we form some kind of cycle. Glucose to lactate, then lactate, then back to glucose, and then back. Uh, as a shifting uh, between the muscle and the liver. Thus, what you are seeing right now is given a name because it has a cyclic pattern. Particularly, the name of this uh, pathway here is called the Cori cycle. And essentially, the purpose of the Cori cycle is to uh, let lactate undergo gluconeogenesis because, again, we don't want that lactate to stay as lactate. So, again, what are the non-carbohydrates for gluconeogenesis? One, pyruvate. Two, our um, glucogenic amino acids. Three, glycerol from our fats. And four, lactate in the case of anaerobic states.